get started. I want to welcome everybody this evening. My name is Steve Feldman. I'm executive director of the Zionist Organization of America's Greater Philadelphia Chapter. I hope everybody is doing well tonight. And for those of you who uh, are in or were in the path of the uh, tropical storm or the hurricane, I hope the uh, damage was not too bad and that you're all doing okay. Uh, joining us this evening, and I'll give proper introductions uh, shortly, is Special Envoy Elon Carr. Uh, and joining us by phone because his power is out is our National President Mort Klein. I want to thank the sponsors of our event tonight, who are Gail and Roy Carden. They're sponsoring this event tonight in memory of Gail's family who were murdered during the Holocaust. So we thank Gail and Roy Carden for sponsoring uh, the event this evening. And I want to thank uh, my colleague Alan Jay, uh, who is uh, monitoring things in the background and working and helping out. And also my colleague, Sharona Whistler, who's uh, also going to be helping out in the background. And I want to welcome uh, my colleague, Howard Katzoff, who I see. Howard, I'm glad you're here tonight. And any of my other colleagues who are here who I haven't uh, seen, welcome. I also want to welcome national ZOA officers and board members, as well as local Greater Philadelphia ZOA board members and officers. Thank you all for being here this evening. I want to remind everyone that ZOA is a nonpartisan organization. Also, if you're going to be using the chat room, please keep the chat content civil and on the topic that we're discussing this evening. Very important uh, because what winds up in the chat room reflects on our organization. But please uh, stick to the topic and keep it civil. Hopefully there'll be time for Q&A. And what I'm gonna do uh, when we get to that point is ask you to raise your hand in the participants window. Uh, there's an option to raise your hand and we'll have questions, uh, God willing, a little bit later. I want to uh, welcome uh, our guests, as I said, Elon S. Carr serves as special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism in the United States State Department. As special envoy advises the Secretary of State and is responsible for directing U.S. policies and projects aimed at countering anti-Semitism throughout the world. Prior to his appointment, Special Envoy Carr was Deputy District Attorney in Los Angeles for, for the County of Los Angeles. Uh, he's an officer in the United States Army Reserves and has received multiple awards and commendations for his nearly two decades of military service. Thank you for your service. In 2003 and 2004, he deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, where he led an anti-terrorism team in life-saving missions throughout the country of Iraq and prosecuted terrorists who attacked U.S. troops. Uh, Special Envoy Carr is the son of Iraqi Jewish refugees who fled persecution in Iraq while he was deployed in Iraq. He met remnants of the Jewish community uh, in Iraq and led Jewish services, ironically, in the former presidential palace of Saddam Hussein. And he is a past international president of A.E. Pi, Jewish fraternity. And Mort Klein, uh, to this audience, uh, probably needs no introduction, but we'll introduce him properly anyway. Mort joins us by phone because of power issues. Mort is now serving in his 28th year at the helm of the Zionist Organization of America. He's one of the world's leading activists on behalf of Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. Mort Klein is a child of Holocaust survivors born in a displaced persons camp in Goodsburg, Germany. Before he became ZOA national president, Mort Klein worked for three United States presidential administrations as an economist in Washington. And prior to that, he was a biostatistician at the UCLA School of Public Health and the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine in Palo Alto, having worked closely with two-time Nobel laureate Linus Pauling for its courage and willingness to speak out on any and all threats to the Jewish community, Israel, and Zionism is unparalleled. Welcome, gentlemen, to our uh, event. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And I would just add that it's not only for this audience that Mort needs no introduction. It's every audience. That's, that's true. That's very true. Uh, just a little introductory remark. Whenever, whatever lid seems to have uh, public displays of Jew hatred in America mostly tamped down, seems to be hanging on precariously 
to a steaming pot today. That pot has always contained traditional Jew hatred, but in recent years it has become a stew that now includes rabid anti-Israel and anti-Zionist invective and attacks locally, nationally, internationally. And we're going to discuss all of that this evening with our guests. So I want to begin, uh, Special Envoy Carr, how much of a problem uh, in your roles, especially advising the State Department and the Secretary of State, how much of a problem today is anti-Israel and anti-Zionist activity within the realm of anti-Semitism or Jew hatred? Well, first of all, let me say how, how happy I am to be with you. You know, uh, you know, ZOA and I go way back, well before my appointment, of course, uh, Mort can tell you that he and I have worked together for, for years in various contexts in the world. And, uh, and it really is, uh, it's a privilege to be with you because ZOA is characterized and your activists are characterized by, by uh, stalwart, strong, morally clear uh, advocacy. Uh, not only for the Jewish people in the state of Israel, but for uh, truly for what is right. And so I, I want to, first of all, tell you really how much I appreciate being with you. And uh, it really is an honor. I know this is a national program and not only a Philly program, but Steve, right. since you are in Philadelphia, I want to highlight something. I was just in Philadelphia, one of my few trips during this pandemic, and I was just in Philadelphia uh, with Secretary Pompeo, uh, yeah. who uh, used the occasion of being in Constitution Hall to unveil the Commission on Unalienable Rights report on, on the importance of, of unaliel unalienable rights to the founding of America and to the continuing enduring definition of, of the American mission. And that's very important because we see in our country today that, that the very goodness of America is under assault. And it's so important that we stand up and defend uh, the great that this country does, the great that this country is. And, uh, and the fight against anti-Semitism is one key example. As you point out, I was appointed to lead America's fight against this pernicious hatred. How amazing is it? that the most powerful country in the history of the world has devoted itself in such a clear fashion to fighting Jew hatred throughout the world. And yes, part of Jew hatred is anti-Zionism. That is a critical point here. And on that score, this administration really takes a backseat to no other. My boss, Secretary Pompeo, stood before 18,000 activists at the APAC policy conference a year and a half ago and said, um, let me go on the record. Anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. And you know, when a member of the cabinet says, let me go on the record, that means it's not a slip of the tongue, prepare yourself for a statement of policy of the United States. And that's exactly what that is. We've doubled down on that principle. Secretary Pompeo has others in the administration. Jared Kushner uh, has in, in an op-ed. And so this is really our marching order. This is who we are. We make no distinction between hating the Jew down the street or hating the Jewish community next door uh, or hating the one and only Jewish state. And that's not just our opinion, that should be everyone's opinion. There is a standard accepted definition of anti-Semitism. The International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. One of my top diplomatic asks when I engage bilaterally and multilaterally overseas is that a country that hasn't adopted that definition do so. The State Department has been using it for, for years. Uh, thanks to President Trump and the executive order he signed in December, it's now adopted for the interagency federally. But that definition makes clear that targeting the state of Israel as a Jewish collective is anti-Semitism. And so we have to be very clear about this. Hatred of the Jewish state is hatred of the Jewish people. And we cannot tolerate it. We have to stigmatize it. We have to stand up and call it what it is. And, uh, and yes, it is a problem because we're seeing anti-Semitism uh, rising, including in the form of hatred of the Jewish state and hatred of, uh, of the Jewish peoplehood and of Jewish self-determination. And Mord, have you seen uh, during your career uh, as at the helm of ZOA and even before that as, a, as an activist on behalf of Israel and Zionism, uh, discuss uh, the increase in the acceptance, uh, if you will, of uh, of anti-Zionist, anti-Israel uh, attacks and effective. Well, first, thank you, Steve. Uh, first of all, I also want to say how thrilled and uh, fortunate we are to have uh, Elon Carr, a brilliant, articulate, 
tireless worker on behalf of this fight against uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, so it's, it's really my honor, uh, Ilan, to be with you. Uh, you're out there internationally uh, having, being able to have a real impact uh, as, a, as a top uh, government official uh, fighting this increasing scourge of Jew hatred. I, I frequently like to call it Jew hatred. It makes it crystal clear what we're talking about. Right. <laughs> and, and yes, we, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in Jew hatred. <laughs> For the first time, we have overt anti-Semites in Congress. We never really had that before. We have, uh, we have Ilan Omar of Minnesota uh, uh, calling the boycott Israel, praising Farrakhan, uh, saying it's Jewish money that controls uh, American government, uh, 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 saying to end all aid to Israel. By the way, even saying she wants to destroy America's political and economic system. So she's even beyond anti-Semitism. She's also, also anti-American, and she's a U.S. Congresswoman. And Rashida Tlaib of Michigan... Uh, 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 takes pictures with uh, Razmia Odeh, a convicted murderer of Jews in Israel, also supports Bordecai in Israel, took Israel off of her map in her office and put Palestine over where it says Israel. <laughs> and, and we've never had these women, being, uh, Congress people, being given such visibility, such media attention as these women. And what's worse, <laughs> we don't have pushback. <laughs> Members of Congress have rarely criticized these two women. And it's even worse. Pelosi, the speaker, and Steny Hoyer, her, his, her deputy, have not only not condemned their anti-Semitism, they've defended them, saying they don't mean it, they don't know what they're talking about, and they've refused to have a specific condemnation of these uh, uh, anti-Semites uh, in Congress. And by the way, I have to add AOC of Queens, also an outright anti-Semite, who's praised the, the labor leader uh, in England, an overt anti-Semite, uh, and also supports boycotting Israel. So we've seen that in Congress. We've seen in the media nonstop attacks on Israel, the Jewish state. When you attack the Jewish state, especially uh, its existence, and irrationally criticizing it, that is anti-Semitism. That means you hate Jews. I can tell you, if you oppose Italy's existence, if you hate Italy, I assure you, you hate Italians. If you oppose France's existence, I assure you, you hate France. So those who oppose Israel's existence and attack and, con and condemn Israel relentlessly and unfairly, they hate Jews. And it's so painful for me to see uh, overt anti-Semitism from the Black Lives Matter movement, the organization. Their platform says that Israel is a genocidal state, committing genocide against Arabs. That's what Black Lives Matter uh, platform says, which is a ridiculous statement. In 1948, there were 200,000 Arabs in Israel. Today, there's almost 2 million. Whoever's in charge of the genocide program must be fired. It's not working. It's really reverse genocide. It's such an insane thing. Of course, they condemn Israel as an apartheid state, even though 15% of the parliament of Israel are Arabs. And they're Arabs in every sphere of Israeli life from hospitals to lawyers to judges, even on the Supreme Court, there's an Arab. And, and they're diplomats, Israeli diplomats who are Arabs. It's not at all an apartheid state. <laughs> and they call for boycotting Israel, for cutting all aid to Israel. And they also publicly state that Israeli police train American police to target blacks. What an ugly, despicable lie. <laughs> and it's really interesting. They only condemn Israel. Why is a so-called civil rights group doing condemning Israel to begin with? And only Israel. They don't condemn Iran. They don't condemn Syria or Sudan or Somalia right. or Libya or Iraq. Uh, only Israel. <laughs> so now we've seen a dramatic increase. And uh, I'll end by saying the biggest problem with this increase is there has been minimal pushback from members of Congress. No condemnation of this in any significant way. Pastors and rabbis have been largely silent. <laughs> the media, <laughs> it's been grotesque how they not only ignore this, but they give platforms to these people. They sh these people should be condemned regularly, and, and it's not happening. And even Jewish leaders, we've had Hayas leaders, the leaders of the former Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, Hayas, Mark Hatchfield and Rabbi Rosen, <laughs> sign a letter uh, demanding to stop condemning Linda Sarsour, an overt anti-Semite, <laughs> and saying we want to work alongside Linda Sarsour 
to make a better world. These are Jewish leaders. We've had almost no condemnation by Jewish leaders of Omar or Tlaib or AOC. In fact, ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, has publicly stated that we want to, uh, we, pr we praise Ilan Omar for her work for a more just and better world. They praised her. This, this is a real problem. We need to get our, our Jewish leaders, our rabbis, our pastors, our members of Congress to be condemning anti-Semitism and the people who promote anti-Semitism uh, with vigor. That's the biggest problem I see as to why this is flourishing at the present time. Yeah, let me jump in on that because I want to say it's very, very important that, that anti-Semitism be called out regardless of where it comes from. And that's why I want to highlight what our administration has done has been absolutely relentless in calling out anti-Semitism regardless of its source. You know, there are three sources of anti-Semitism. There's the ethnic supremacists of the far right, the anti-Zionists and Israel haters of the radical left, and militant Islamists. These are three different ideological camps, but yet they find common ground when it comes to Jew hatred. And as I said it from day one, since I was appointed, we will not ignore or minimize any part of the ideological spectrum because when it comes to Jew hatred, what it doesn't matter what ideological clothing it wears. Jew hatred is Jew hatred. And exactly. so this administration, when uh, uh, Lori Kay was murdered in, in a Poway synagogue by a, a far right ethnic supremacist, um, I was asked by the White House to go and represent the administration, and we said then that we are, we, this administration, and we, the United States, are at war with these ethnic supremacists of the far right. And in fact, what President Trump has done and what Secretary Pompeo has done, unprecedented, first time ever in U.S. history, is, is designate a far right anti-Semitic group as a terrorist organization. Never been done before. So we're fighting anti-Semites on the far right. When it comes to the left, uh, where you see this boiling over, especially on college campuses. Okay. President Trump signed an executive order that was a game changer in the fight against the anti-Semitism of the far left that finds such acceptance on college campuses. An executive order that says enough with the harassment and discrimination against oh. Jewish students. And of course, when it comes to militant Islam, this administration has been second to none in terms of standing up for the state of Israel and for the rights and privileges of the state of Israel. And so we are, we are equal opportunity combatants when it comes to anti-Semitism. But let me say something about Congress. This is very important. Um, while we are hearing some members of Congress say things that we couldn't have imagined just a few years ago, right. uh, it is also really important that we preserve the bipartisan nature of the fight against anti-Semitism. I want to highlight uh, the, the Senate Bipartisan Task Force on Anti-Semitism put together by Senator Rosen and Senator Lankford uh, is fighting anti-Semitism and fighting to keep it bipartisan. Same with the House Bipartisan Task Force on Anti-Semitism. And in fact, legislation pending right now to give my office more authority and more budget uh, was championed by members of, of the House and members of the Senate from both parties. So it's, it's critically important that we not lose the bipartisan focus on fighting anti-Semitism and fighting Jew hatred, regardless of whether it comes from the far right, the radical left, or militant Islam. Special Envoy Carr, when, when someone attacks Israel or Zionism and they claim they're not against Israel, they just have an issue with the Israeli government, which of course is democratically elected, is that legitimate or is that just an attempt to uh, divert from their real uh, animus towards Israel and the Jewish people? Well, certainly criticism of Israel and criticism of Israeli policy is absolutely legitimate. One can criticize, take issue with policies of Israel. One can criticize and take issues uh, with policies of the United States. But if, if that criticism questions the right of the Jewish people as a people to self-determination in the Jewish homeland, if that questions the right of the state of Israel to exist, or if that criticism propagates what Moore talked about, these, these modern versions of the blood libel, that's what that is, suggesting that, that this, this country that is a model of democracy and enlightenment and innovation and tikkun olam, that, that the state of Israel is committing genocide or that the state of Israel is an apartheid regime, this is nothing other than the modern manifestation of the, of the medieval bloodline against the Jewish people. If that's the criticism you're talking about, it is anti-Semitism and it is rank anti-Semitism. And let me say something else as well. 
Let's talk about criticism that doesn't venture into blood libels and slander. Let's talk about uh, criticism of Israeli policy. Sure, that's legitimate. But if Israel is being held to a double standard to which no other democracy is held, that's also anti-Semitism. Holding Jews to a double standard or applying a double standard to Jews is anti-Semitism. And you know what says that? Again, the IRA definition on anti-Semitism says that. Sure. In one of the examples, it says applying a double standard to the state of Israel to which other democracies aren't held is an example of anti-Semitism. And so, of course, criticism is legitimate, but we have to make sure and, and, uh, and look carefully to make sure that, that criticism is fair and legitimate. If not fair and legitimate, do we censor it? No, we believe in, in the free speech. We believe that even hate-filled speech is protected speech in the United States, but we have to call it out. We have to call it what it is, which is anti-Semitism. Exactly. Mort, do you, do you agree or is there, is there a distinction between uh, fair criticism, the legitimate criticism of a particular act by the Israeli government versus just using that as a smokescreen for Jew hatred? Muted or am I all right? No, you're, you're gone. I'm on you're mute. Okay. I'm good. <laughs> First of all, look, obviously legitimate criticism is legitimate, as, uh, uh, as Elon Carr stated, of course. <laughs> but when uh, criticism delves into lying and making extreme, ridiculous statements, such as Israel's an apartheid genocidal state, <laughs> Israel trains police <laughs> in America to target blacks, that's anti-Semitism. Also, when you have a group or a person who c criticizes only Israel, but never criticizes other countries, which are truly horrific human rights abusers, Iran, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Venezuela, if they're only attacking Israel, then you know it's because it's filled with Jews. That if it was filled with non-Jews, they wouldn't be doing it. So, uh, and, and I would say most of the criticism of Israel, uh, significant criticisms, really come from people of enmity toward Jewish people. Um, and, uh, and I have to tell the truth. One of the problems we have on campuses are students for justice in Palestine, which is largely Muslim students. <laughs> There's non-Muslims as well. And all they do is condemn Israel with lies repeatedly. <laughs> and when I looked at the uh, ADL, the Anti-Defamation League's own statistics, own polling, it shows that in America, 34% of Muslims are anti-Semitic, 34%. Around the world, it's 49%. And Muslims from the Middle East, from Libya, Syria, uh, Iran, Iraq, 74 to 93% are anti-Semitic. So we should be acutely aware we have a real problem with Muslims having a, dis a disproportionate and extraordinary uh, uh, hatred of Jewish people more than any other identifiable group. This is not a statement of, of feel of of an anti-Islam statement. This is a statement of fact that the ADL polling shows, so we should be acutely aware of this. And that's why it is so troubling, for example, that Hayas, for example, is resettling Muslims from the Middle East, 90% uh, or so of which are anti-Semitic, bringing anti-Semites into this country from countries that are terrorist countries, and are uh, countries which cannot vet these people to look into their backgrounds to see uh, uh, who they are. Uh, so the bottom line is when you see people um, lying about Israel in their criticism, that's anti-Semitism. When you see people criticizing only Israel, not any other country, you know it's because Israel's filled with Jews. Steve, uh, an example of what Mort's talking about is the UN Human Rights Council, which is uh, obsessive in its, in its focus, its pathological focus on the state of Israel. And how proud all of us should be as Americans that our country stood up and walked out. The President Trump said, enough is enough. We, we are no longer going to sit at the same table and, and be, be uh, complicit in this singling out and bullying of the one Jewish state in the world. No, no, no more. And so we, we picked up our chips and walked away. And that's an example of the kind of leadership that we need to, to bring to, uh, you know, to the world. We're not going to tolerate that anymore. Now, let me say something about Muslims. I know, I know a lot about the history of Islam because, again, like you said, Steve, in the introduction, uh, I, my family comes from that part of the world, and you know, our, my family's first language was Arabic. Um, there's no question that there's been a problem uh, in Islam today. Today, the chief state sponsor of anti-Semitism is the Islamic Republic of Iran. And, and this is a key point. Uh, anti-Semitic, why is it that 
that these polls are showing that there are Muslim attitudes as they are, because there's a there is an indoctrination of Muslims that is being driven largely by Iran. The Islamic Republic of Iran is pushing anti-Semitic uh, agendas, narratives, and even educational curricula. Um, not only in Iran but throughout the Middle East, and this is a key key point. Actually, an ADL study, ADL just did a study of of Lebanese schools. Uh, those Lebanese schools that are funded in part by Iranian lar largesse, and guess what? Horrific, horrific anti-Semitic indoctrination in those schools. So the Islamic Republic of Iran uh, bears a, a, an enormous amount of blame here, and we've got to call them out. And uh, and that's why uh, this administration is applying the kind of pressure we're applying to Iran. Let me say something else as well. The Arab world now. Let's talk about the Arab world. Is is more ready today than ever before to turn over a new page. I'm happy to say that we're working on incredibly important initiatives with our Arab allies, specifically to address anti-Semitism in the Arab world. And, uh, and there are incredible leaders. Uh, the King of Morocco, the King of Bahrain, uh, the Secretary General of the Muslim World League, Sheikh Mohammed al Raith, who's been an incredible leader. To say enough, enough with anti-Semitism, let's, let's now talk about philo-Semitism in the Arab world. And so we're very excited about about uh, real potential there uh, in the Arab world. And let me tell you, if we can fix anti-Semitism in the Arab world, it's not just limited there. What happens in, in the Arab world directly affects the European street and the US college campuses. And so this is a very important point and I'm very excited about some of the initiatives we're working on in that region. No, we're, we're <laughs> grateful for uh, your work in the Trump administration's push back against, against anti-Semitism, new hatred. Uh, it's really unprecedented what the administration is doing. Uh, I, I would add, Special Envoy Carr, to your, your three groups of, uh, of Jew hatred, a fourth group, which is uh, Jewish anti-Israel and anti-Zionist activities. So I, I would maintain that there is four. But the question I have for you is, who or what is to blame for this dramatic rise of Jew hatred, anti-Zionism, anti-Israel attacks from those four spheres? Is there, is there one or two trends that, that there's a blame for that you would attribute the rise to? Well, there are, there are a few trends that, that, are, you know, that, that have caused and driven that, that rise in anti-Semitism. But let me talk about the key factor here. The key factor is the internet and social media. Um, the internet and social media doesn't cause anti-Semitism, goodness knows, but it is the chief vector of this disease. And what's happening is that, is that Jew hatred from all three camps, the far right, the radical left, and militant Islam, is making use of new technology, the internet and social media, uh, to transmit its ideologies on a global scale at the speed of light to recruit adherents and to radicalize them. Now, let me tell you, this is having a real effect. A recent European study shows that the, the time it takes to radicalize a young man, and I'm being gender specific because they're almost always men, the amount of time it takes to radicalize a young man online is 30% of the time that it takes to radicalize that same young man offline, you know, through, through meetings and movements and, and rallies and all the ways it used to be done. And so this is real. I mean, you, we're seeing um, American kids, European kids, Latin American kids, all over the world, we're seeing, we're seeing and certainly in the, in the Middle East, sucked into uh, ch internet chat rooms that are, that are venomous places of, of hatred and, and vile and, and real violence. And, and they're getting increasingly radicalized at record speed. And some of those, well, some of those actually make the transition to actual violent acts. Saw that in Pittsburgh, we saw that in Poway, <clears throat> saw that with other kinds of active shooters. And we're seeing that also um, on the far left and in militant Islam as well. So it is absolutely important that we deal with this. I'm proud to say that I'm the first <laughs> special envoy in this position to have a, a principal <laughs> team member, assistant special envoy on my team, assigned to focus exclusively on the issue of internet and social media anti-Semitism. It's never been done before. We're working on some exciting initiatives because we really need to fix this and fix it in the framework of the First Amendment. You know, just because we believe that even despicable hate speech is protected by the First Amendment, as it is, that doesn't mean that you can't focus on the problem and that there aren't real solutions you can bring to bear to address this, this public health crisis. You know, we all know about public health crises now. Well, 
you know, the spread of hatred, anti-Semitism and racism and all kinds of horrific forms of hatred on the internet and social media is a public health crisis. And so we've got to address it. I would, I would add also that the media does foment a lot of anti-Israel, meaning anti-Jewish uh, sentiments through, through its misreporting on, on Israel and the Middle East. I really think that that's a factor. Uh, what do you attribute the, the dramatic rise in the two hatred and, and these attacks to? Well, <laughs> I think you've had in, uh, there's been a dramatic rise, I think, in part because too many Jewish leaders <laughs> publicly and falsely and erroneously <laughs> criticize Israel for the so-called occupation, <laughs> well, even though the facts are, and uh, it's never written about, they never talk about it, the facts are Israel's given away all of Gaza, 40% of Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, where 99% of the Arabs live. They live under their own rule. There is no occupation. The only difference, <laughs> the only, uh, interference that Israel takes in the lives of Palestinians is security. And if Arab uh, 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 groups weren't uh, developing terror groups to come into Israel and murder Jews, uh, Israeli troops would not be in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Arab areas of Judea and Samaria. <laughs> and, uh, and also, they continue to promote a, a Palestinian state, uh, even though uh, uh, Abbas is a terrorist dictator, uh, who uh, names school streets and sports teams and children's camps after Jew killers, pays Arabs to murder Jews. He pays Arabs to murder Jews. They get a lifetime pension if they murder a Jew. And the pension is four or five times the average salary of a Palestinian Arab in the territories. <laughs> and the more Jews an Arab kills, the higher their pension. <laughs> so, uh, uh, So we should not be promoting a Palestinian state. Jewish people should not. It'll be an Iran-Hamas terror state, and yet they do this. <laughs> and really one of the worst things that allows this to uh, 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 increase uh, uh, is the fact that Jewish leaders uh, and others do not condemn these anti-Semites by name. Just uh, for example, Black Lives Matter, as I mentioned before, <laughs> whose platform is incredibly anti-Semitic, uh, by the way, noted by Caroline Glick, Melanie Phillips, uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz have all written articles how anti-Semitic they are. <laughs> and when I wrote a series of articles exposing the Black Lives Matter group, not the theme of equal rights, voting rights, civil rights, of course we all support that. <laughs> uh, uh, but their, their attacks on Israel, inappropriate attacks, when I wrote about this, 16 Jewish leaders, <laughs> including the leaders of the reform movement, Rabbi Jacobs, the leaders of the conservative movement, including Rabbi Blumenthal, <laughs> uh, 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 the Amenu, uh, the chairman of Hayas, Robert Aronson, most of the Jewish women's groups publicly attacked me, saying I am promoting hatred uh, and I'm promoting uh, racism uh, by my simply telling the truth about the Black Lives Matter uh, 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 platform. So when they do something like that, it encourages Black Lives Matter and encourages their anti-Semitism, uh, when in fact there was virtually no Jewish group that defended me publicly and other Jewish groups demand that I be thrown out of the conference for exposing Black Lives Matter's platform. J Street did, New Israel Fund did, Trua, JVP, uh, if not now, demanded, even though they're not in the conference of presidents, demanded I be thrown out, and nobody uh, uh, defended me in the Jewish world. This only gives solace and strength to anti-Semites when they see that Jews will attack somebody attacking anti-Semites. It only strengthens them. <laughs> We have to let our Jewish leaders know this is intolerable and, un un and unacceptable. <laughs> and, and yet, <laughs> this is what has been going on. And uh, also, when you have issues like when uh, Elon Omar, Congresswoman Omar, and Congresswoman Tlaib wanted to come to Israel, uh, obviously to do terrible things in terms of publicity, Netanyahu would not let him enter. And you know what happened when he wouldn't let them? AIPAC condemned Israel, uh, Israel publicly, AJ Committee publicly. ADL publicly, there was virtually no group that defended Netanyahu except ZOA. So when anti-Semites see that Jewish groups are defending anti-Semites, it only encourages them. This is a real problem. We have to make it clear that anti-Semites must be condemned publicly and vigorously by name. Otherwise, you will encourage these anti-Semites to be stronger 
and to be even more anti-Semitic. So to me, that's one of the really biggest problems we have is no pushback against anti-Semites by name. And that's true in universities. I'll finish with this. When we plead with the presidents of universities to condemn Students for Justice in Palestine or other anti-Semitic groups, they refuse. All they do is they come out with a statement condemning anti-Semitism in general. That doesn't send a message to Students for Justice in Palestine or others that they're the ones who are horrible. That doesn't embarrass them or humiliate them. <laughs> and, and so we have that same problem with the university presidents throughout the country, I'm afraid. Those uh, pay to slay payments, yeah. the terrorists and the Palestinian Authority, that doesn't come from US tax money anymore because President Trump said, enough, you're gonna pay terrorists, we're defunding you. And our administration has, has defunded uh, the PA to the extent that they're paying uh, terrorists for, for killing Jews. Um, and then furthermore, with regard to the occupation, the so-called occupation, you're absolutely right that this has been a, uh, a weapon used to bludgeon Israel for years. Uh, that's why Secretary Pompeo uh, removed the term occupied territories from the uh, State Department human rights reports. Uh, that's why we issued an official opinion that said that that Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria are not per se uh, against international law. And that's why President Trump has unveiled uh, a, the peace vision, uh, a vision for, for uh, a, an Israeli-Palestinian peace that acknowledges the indelible historic Jewish connections to the Jewish homeland, including in parts of Judea and Samaria. And so that is why it is so important to build the foundation of peace, God willing, it should come, but to build that foundation <laughs> on truth and to state things accurately and not to state th and not to, to create these, these fantasies that then people use to attack Israel, including uh, through anti-Semitic canards. Special Envoy Clark, how dangerous is intersectionality? We've seen with some of the Black Lives Matter protests and, and uh, violence, uh, synagogues, Jewish businesses attack, graffiti. Uh, there's demonstrations where uh, Israel's been accused of killing Arab children. How, how dangerous uh, is this right now, this intersectionality? Well, there are two, um, two movements we see two ideologies, I should say, we see on the left. Um, one is an open hostility to any form of nationalism, and the other is intersectionality. Um, both are very dangerous for the state of Israel, and both undermine not only the, the existence of the Jewish state, but the very idea that Jews are a people with a right to self-determination. Right. Um, this hostility toward nationalism, which, which sadly some Jews have signed on to, is, uh, is, is really... Um, you know, is, it really undermines in a very fundamental way the right of the state of Israel to exist. That's why when I talk about the, the, the ugly anti-Semitic far right, it's not about nationalism, it's about ethnic supremacism. The idea that, that we should hate anyone who's not like, like us. Um, you know, that is obviously vile, hated, hateful ideologies that have to be condemned. But nationalism, <laughs> the idea that, that, that a, a people with, with kinship should have some you know, should have self-determination. Um, the idea that that is, uh, is, uh, is, is somehow odious or needs to be opposed directly undermines Zionism because these people say, well, exhibit A of nationalism is Zionism and, and therefore it's, it's wrong ab initio. And that's, we have to push back against that. And especially Jewish leaders have to say, no, no, there's a distinction between, between benign nationalism and ethnic supremacism, number one. Number two, the other ideology mm -hmm. on the far left is intersectionality, which is, you know, this idea that that uh, that you know uh, power is wrong, and that privilege is is automatically oppression, and and that people who people who uh, can claim to be of color, whether they actually are or not, are automatically oppressed, and and exhibit A is always the Jews, right? Doesn't matter if Jews are are from the Middle East. I mean, we have. Certainly there are no shortage of Jews of color, Jews who come from the Middle East, like my family, Jews who come from Ethiopia, who are, who are black, um, but yet Jews are exhibit A of, um, of, of white oppressors. And this is a, a rank anti-Semitic ideology and has to be called out as such. And so yes, uh, these two ideologies, anti-nationalism combined with intersectionality are, are very much uh, 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 poised and working together to attack the very foundations of, of Jewish peoplehood 
and Jewish self-determination. Okay. On, on the topic of intersectionality, what, what can be done, do you think, in your opinion, to try and uh, break up these, these uh, joint attacks from these different groups that seem to be solely on the Jewish people in Israel? Is, is there a way to have a wedge or to, or to fight this intersectionality? Well, yeah, part of that is reaching out. You know, one of the most, um, one of the most impressive university programs I've ever seen. And for those of you watching this who are involved on campuses, let me tell you, this was just the best thing ever. And I, I saw this on two separate campuses where the pro-Israel groups brought together in one room, pretty much every single elected president on campus. You had the president of the student body. You had the president of the, the, the IFC and of Panhellenic. You had the, the editor in chief of the the school paper. You had the presidents of the fraternities and of the sororities. You had the, the college Republicans and the college Democrats. And you had the president of the, the African American group and the Hispanic group and of the veterans groups. And all of these elected presidents were brought into a room to, to hear from speakers about why they should care. And you know, look, ZOA cares, but, but we sometimes can take for granted that basic question, why should someone else care? about Jewish self-determination? Why should someone else embrace Jewish history and champion it? Why should anyone care about the state of Israel? These are questions that really are fair questions that ought to be answered. And so to be able to explain, not only to campus leaders, but to those leaders who were elected to serve their own parochial interests, and nothing wrong with that. They were elected to be champions of a parochial interest, to explain to them why they should embrace the cause of Jewish peoplehood and Jewish history and the state of Israel, this was magic. Let me tell you, it was magic. And I could see that, that this captivated uh, these leaders on campus. And leaders on campus, let me tell you something. The kid who gets elected president on campus doesn't stop running for things. Newsflash. If there are leaders in school, they're going to be leaders outside of school and after school. And so this is very, very important. And we can reach out and build these bridges, and we can educate our peers, and we've got to do that. You know, one of the most exciting initiatives I'm working on, of all of the things, you know, let me tell you, Steve, most of what I do in fighting anti-Semitism is defensive. We right. deal with security of Jewish communities, and we deal with hate crimes prosecutions, and we deal with condemnation of anti-Semitic speech, right, left, and, 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 and militant Islamist. That's all defensive, and you've got to defend against the attack, right? The you need to be proactive also. And going but you to also have to be proactive and you don't win anything. Not a, not a battle and not even a, a sports event. If all you do is <laughs> one of the most exciting initiatives that we're working on is to turn the tables 180 degrees and go on the offense against anti-Semitism. And how do you do that? By driving a philo-Semitic narrative that does exactly what we're talking about, that teaches our fellow Americans and teaches our allies around the world why they should care, and what the Jewish people have brought to the world, to civilization, and to their own countries. I mean, look, can you, can you tell the history of the United States without talking about Jewish contributions to what our country is? Can you tell the history of, of England, or Germany, or France, or Russia, or Poland, or Hungary, and the list goes on, without talking about the, the remarkable Jewish history? Exactly. Do we do that enough? And the answer is no. And so we are working with our allies around the world to develop philo-Semitic Semitic curricula for their schools, to drive philo-Semitic narratives for their people. And here, right here in the United States, there is a, a month, Jewish American Heritage Month. I talk about this and everyone says, I've never heard of this. Jewish American Heritage Month, specifically geared to doing this, gift wrapped on a silver platter. And you know what happens during Jewish Heritage Month? Nothing happens during Jewish Heritage Month. Nothing happens. The Jewish community does nothing, unlike for for uh, African American Heritage Month, where there's programming and curriculum. And so we've got to get serious, Steve, about being proactive against <laughs> anti Semitism and answering that basic question of why should I care? There are very good reasons why everyone should care about the Jewish people in, this, in the state of Israel. And we've got to start answering those questions and, and developing the narrative and the curriculum that answers those, those questions. Mort, what is your take on intersectionality and, and the dangers that it poses uh, to our people? <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I, what, I what, is your, what is your opinion of intersectionality and the dangers it poses to our people? These, these disparate groups that are coming together to attack Israel and the Jews. Yes. Well, <laughs> look. One of the problems that Zia Way 
we cover 100 campuses. One of the problems we see is that uh, students, Jewish and, and non-Jewish, learn to have enmity toward Israel based on falsehoods. They don't know the truth of the Arab-Islamic war against Israel. <laughs> so we at CIA see, we find that when we teach them the truth and they learn the reality of what the situation is, they suddenly stop being haters of Israel. <laughs> when they realize, for example, as I mentioned, that there's no occupation. <laughs> In fact, occupation means you've stolen someone else's sovereign land. <laughs> In fact, uh, this was no one's sovereign land. And the Jews have a greater historic, political, and legal right to it than the Arabs. This area was called Judea and Samaria. We, are, we Jews are Judeans. Sure. <laughs> there was never a country named Palestine. College students are shocked when they hear that. There was never any Palestinian kings or queens. <laughs> and when they, when they find out that it's a dictatorship, when they find out they name school streets and sports teams after Jew killers and pay Arabs to murder Jews, when they find out, and this really shocks them, that Israel is offered a state to the Palestinian dictatorship three times in the last 20 years, three times. And they've turned it down, the Palestinian Arabs, every time with no counteroffers. And they've been offered a state six times in the last 80 years, from 1937 on, and they've turned it down every time. Why? They turn it down because they're required to sign a document saying they support the right of the existence of a Jewish state. They won't do that. And they also demand the right of Arabs to move into Israel so-called refugees, <laughs> and of course, Israel cannot permit this. <laughs> so we find that when uh, people on campus who, who join with the uh, uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel groups like Arab groups, when they learn the truth, uh, we find that their views change. And plus we bring some, some of these non-Jews and many Jews to Israel, uh, and they see firsthand what Israel is all about, their minds uh, change. <laughs> In fact, only last week, as some of you may have heard, I had a two-hour conversation with Ice Cube, who did not know much about Israel, but he had said some things that were inappropriate toward Jews in Israel. <laughs> when I explained the truth to him, <laughs> he then came out and tweeted. Ice Cube is one of the you know, best-known black rappers in America, and, and also a, a movie star. He's done dozens of movies. <laughs> he came out and he praised uh, uh, Ahmed Jabbar, uh, uh, the great basketball player. He said, you are right. Abdul Jabbar to condemn black anti Semitism. I support it. He, he said, I hate anti Semites. He tweeted this out himself. I hate anti Semitism. And he tweeted out and he told me, I can tell anyone that I want that Ice Cube has given me permission to say that he, Ice Cube, supports the right of Israel to be, exist as a Jewish state. So when Ice Cube learned all the, many of the facts from me in a two hour conversation, his mind was totally changed. He's now with us. He's told me he wants to come to our dinner uh, next year. Uh, he wants to buy several tables. He wants me to come to his house. He wants to come to my house. Uh, uh, and this was all based on learning the reality and the truth of the Arab Islamic war against Israel. So education is important. <laughs> uh, and, we, and we have to have Jewish leaders stop condemning Israel for occupation that doesn't exist. And promoting a Palestinian state, while well, it's simply a terrorist regime. As long as Jewish leaders keep saying we have to give them a Palestinian state, every minute we don't give this terrorist regime a state, it, it looks like you're oppressing them. We have to say no state until you do certain things to show you can become part of the civilized world, which they have not done uh, uh, at the present time. <laughs> so uh, we find that uh, uh, teaching these truths uh, does have an impact on students. But unfortunately, most of the Jewish groups on campuses condemn the, uh, the, the, phony, the so-called occupation, promote a state, condemn Jews living in Judea and Samaria. Uh, uh, there's 500,000 Jews who now live in Judea and Samaria. <laughs> and uh, uh, we really have to start telling the whole truth. We Jewish leaders, that has not happened now for decades. It's a tragedy. If anybody has a question for either of our guests, please use the raise your hand option in the participants window. Click on participants, which is on the bottom, look for your name, and there's an option to raise your hand. And we'll try and get to a couple uh, that we have time for. Before we take questions though, friends, this evening you've heard about some of the challenges that our community faces, and you can help ZOA not only to meet these challenges, but also as we've been talking about to proactively help Israel, the Jewish people, and Zionism. 
by financially supporting the work of the Zionist Organization of America. Please, if you're in the greater Philadelphia area, support our chapter. You can reach us uh, by email at office at zoaphilly.org, office at zoaphilly.org, and the information is in the chat room, or you can go to our website, which is philly.zoa.org and make a donation. If you're outside of the Philadelphia area, please support <laughs> National ZOA, reach National ZOA by email at info at zoa.org, or go to their website, www.zoa.org and both uh, the local site and the national site have a tremendous amount of information to help you learn about these issues and do advocacy so please uh, go there uh, and contribute if you can uh, are there any hands up let's see please, let me just um so i don't get in trouble with our lawyers say that uh, okay. that my presence here is not in any way meant to uh uh, to you know, to encourage solicitation or or uh, contributions to ZOA. Obviously, I can't do that. Understood. Uh, I just wanted to say, I, I you know, I'm I'm here as a as a government official to you know to understand. Talk to and we thank you. And, and no, we're not we're not insinuating that you're uh, that you're pitching for us. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we're going to take a couple questions. Time is limited, but uh, please, in the interest of fairness and respect for the other people who've got questions, please keep it to a question not a statement and, and get to the point with your question. And Eric Silkov, uh, please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Yeah, Eric thank Silkov. you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to ask Ilan a question on uh, oh, yeah. ABC Nightline on, on July 21st, only a couple of weeks ago, they had a session on John Lewis, a tribute, and he was actually very good for Israel in my, in my understanding. But then afterwards, they wanted to show how uh, he influenced people. So they interviewed a woman named Sahar Faraj, who is a Palestinian Israel hater. And they said, oh, look how the great work he inspired her to go on and, 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 and be Palestinian rights. I, I was outraged. And they talk about the intersectionality, just like you talked about. I was outraged, but I don't know where to go to Please protest. Please get to your question. Please get to your question. My question is, how do we protest something like that on, on national TV? Uh, I was hoping Ilan could tell us, because I, I see that as Jew hatred as well. Look, the media, you know, very often misrepresents things. I mean, there's a narrative to which they're wedded, and uh, they don't, you know, they don't let facts get in the way of the narrative. <laughs> And so, look, uh, you know, we deal with this all the time. Um, you know, you look, at the, you look at the president's speech at Mount Rushmore, which, uh, you know, you, you, it brings tears to your eyes. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a speech that was so incredible. And then just look at the headlines. Um, it's, uh, they're on a different planet. And it's, uh, it's very sad. And, and you, know, I, I, uh, you know, I'm a New Yorker and, uh, you know, born and raised. I, I, I grew up on some of these, you know, great, uh, media venues and and uh, it's very sad really to see you know to see them uh, bringing about these self-inflicted wounds that that cause the American people to just stop trusting them and and that's sad it's sad for it's sad for our country but these are self-inflicted wounds by these uh, by these media venues and, and one last question why can't we get rid no, of no, the we can't we can't we can't and replace Eric, we it with can't. I'm sorry we, we have limited time uh, Fran Schussman, you have a question. Please unmute yourself. <laughs> Are you able to unmute yourself, Fran? We can can't you, hear you. Can you hear me now? There we go. Yes, thank you. I have one basic question. How do you get the rabbis and the Jewish leaders to speak up for us instead of against us? They stand in front of congregations with thousands of people and preach lies. How do you attack that? <laughs> That's my question. How do you get these rabbis to speak up and do their part? So look, there are, there are very, very many wonderful rabbis who are, who are champions of not only of the Jewish people, but really champions of, of, of making our world a better place, um, as well they should be. Are there some who are not? You know, sure. Are there Jewish groups who, who, are, who have opened up uh, in, in a full frontal assault on the Jewish people and on the Jewish future and on Jewish self-determination? Uh, yes, I mean, that's, that's the way it is. And, 
And I tell you, 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 can't, you can't nor should you stop people because it's a free country and, and, and people are free to, to, to even to be wrong. But, but what the Jewish community would be well advised to do is call them out on it. I mean, you know, when you have fringe groups that are, that are saying, you know, sure, the, it's a big tent, but, but not everyone can be in the tent. I mean, if, if a, and if a group is, is dedicated to destroying the Jewish people in the Jewish future, um, they're not in the tent and they can't be in the tent. Right. And the response of the Jewish community needs to be to draw those red lines and say, this is not acceptable. And, and to call it anti-Semitism. Look, I've, I've done that very publicly. I mean, I will tell you that, that uh, in, in a number of, of speeches, I was asked about this and I've, I've talked about JVP, you know, an organization that, that hides behind you know, a J in its name, but, but is, uh, you know, is an organization that openly and, and regularly traffics in anti-Semitism. Um, we've got to be able to say that. And, and just like we shouldn't hold any person of any ethnicity to a double standard, Jews shouldn't be held to a double standard either. And if they're talking anti-Semitism, they ought to be called out for talking anti-Semitism. And in fact, uh, they can sometimes be more destructive uh, by, by uh, undermining mm -hmm. um, and by being used really as a tool uh, exactly. for, for anti-Semites mm -hmm. you know, who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who then use their, their anti-Semitism to say that, see, this is okay. And so we've got to be very forceful on this. Mort, anything mm -hmm. to add on, uh, on uh, anti-Semitism and Zionism coming from within the Jewish community? Mort, are you still there? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here. What was that? I'm sorry. Do you have, would you like to add anything on the fact that uh, these not inflicted Jew hatred, if you will, from yes. the Jewish community? Yes, look, the reform movement chose Rabbi Rick Jacobs to be the head of the national reform movement. This is a man that was one of the officials on the boards, one of the boards of J Street, an anti israel organization. Why didn't members of Reform Synagogue scream about this, say, no, we don't want this man to be uh, the leader of the Reform Movement. People in his own congregation should be complaining. Members of congregations of Reform and Conservative Synagogues, and even Orthodox where it applies, should be uh, publicly uh, criticizing their rabbis for making statements that are very hostile to Israel and say, we won't tolerate this. Uh, but uh, too many uh, leaders uh, of Jewish organizations and rabbis uh, uh, blame Israel for all the problems, blame Israel for lack of peace, even though Abbas has refused to sit down and negotiate for 10 years. The man is a terrorist dictator, won't even negotiate, and you have rabbi after rabbi blaming Israel and Netanyahu for lack of peace, and we need more members of, of their congregations to criticize these rabbis and say, we won't tolerate this. But I see that people are really quite quiet. They don't want to confront their rabbis and they really have to do it because they're hurting us. And many of these rabbis, I said, has even attacked ZOA for condemning anti-Semites like Black Lives Matter and, uh, and, and other such groups. We have to hear their Let me just make, let me have just to make it clear because one, I don't- One second, gentlemen. <laughs> Special Envoy Carr, will you be able to stick around a little longer because we're running late. We have important things to cover. Yeah, I can, you... I can stick around for a little bit longer, but then I've got another-, another Okay. Call. I'll just say, um, I, I just want to clarify, and I, I'm sure Mort didn't mean to, uh, to, to talk about the whole reform movement. I, I mean, I know many <laughs> rabbis and conservative rabbis that are champions of these issues. Um, I'm sure Mort knows them as well. And so I-, I uh, I just want to make clear this is not a denomination. This is a personal issue. You know, there are people who are who are secular. There are people who are really, I mean, look, you had, you had a, 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 somebody who calls himself observant, Peter Beinart, right, who, who, uh, who just came out and basically, um, you know, basically advocated for the end of the state of Israel as a Jewish state. So this isn't, a, this isn't a denominational issue. It's a, it's an ideological issue. I mean, some you know, some people out there just, just don't get it. And, uh, and you're right, we have to call them out on it. Uh, folks, in the chat room are uh, a list of some upcoming ZOA webinar events. Please check uh, the chat room for those. Also, coming up in March, God willing, will be uh, another ZOA spectacular mission to Israel. For information about that, please contact National <laughs> ZOA. It's going to be taking place in March, God willing. Uh, that's info at zoa.org for details about that mission. Uh, we have a question from Cheryl Silver. Uh, please unmute yourself, Cheryl. 
thanks, thanks, Steve, and thank you, Elon, for being here tonight. <laughs> uh, we've we've met in you know in Florida a couple of times at the uh, recent Boca Raton event you did. Yes, I remember. How are you? Great, 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 and so pleased you're here. <laughs> we we really appreciate you at COA. Good to be with you. Thank you. Um, so, quick question, um, and I'm trying, you know, in a nonpartisan way, <laughs> trying to ask this. Um, <laughs> and in light of the positions that uh, the Democratic presidential candidate has recently taken, and some of the people he embraced at this Muslim, uh, Muslim million Muslim voter summit, Linda Sarsour, Ilan Omar, etc. Have you, I'm curious, have you had an opportunity, have you been invited at all to, to connect with uh, Jews who tend to lean more left and who have embraced this uh, Mr. Biden's campaign? And um, do they see the conflict in this? Do they see the, well, the dangers to Israel and to the Jewish people of some of the people they're now consorting with? First, of all, all, first of all, all the time. I mean, I, I'm, I address groups, now I don't, I don't go to, I don't go to friends <laughs> <the> left <laughs> audience, nor do I get invited, but even if I did, I wouldn't. Um, but, but sure, I address left of center groups all the time because like I said, I mean, this has got to be a bipartisan fight. The fight for the future of the Jewish people and the fight against this ancient, relentless, despicable hatred that is anti-Semitism is not a partisan issue and it's not a, it's not a political issue. It's a policy issue. It's an issue of right and wrong. And you know, there are many, many people who are left of center. You can call them either partisanly Democrats or, or, or liberal ideologically, who get it, who understand it, who are champions of this cause. I mean, I work with them in Congress all the time on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, people like, uh, like uh, Jackie Rosen and Ted Deutsch and Elliot Engel and, and uh, Max Rose and, and the list goes on and on. I mean, really, re really people who have been, and it's, it's not, I happen to name Jewish names. I mean. You know, Steny Hoyer was mentioned earlier. Steny Hoyer has been a, an incredible advocate for the state of Israel over many, many years. And so, it's, you know, it really, um, this, this isn't, as I say it, this isn't about party and this isn't about politics. It's about policy. And the same thing, by the way, when it comes to acknowledging the unprecedented efforts of President Trump and this administration to stand up for the Jewish people to fight for the Jewish people, to support the state of Israel, to combat anti-Semitism. You know, you don't have to be a Republican to acknowledge that. I speak to, to, again, I speak to all kinds of audiences and I say, look, you know, it's about policy. And, and when the president does something that is, that is right, right for the world, all of us should stand up, regardless of what party we're in, we all should stand up and say, Mr. President, thank you. You have our support. On this issue, you have our support. And this is a very, very important point to make and thing to say. And so, uh, and so I, you know, I've always, always advocated that the fight against anti-Semitism and the fight for the Jewish people in the state of Israel must remain bipartisan. I want to remind everybody to please uh, consider making a donation to support COA, either locally in the greater Philadelphia area or nationally. We really can use your support to continue our fight. We apologize to those who had their hands up that we don't have time to call on you. I do apologize. I, I see there are many questions, but we are running long already. I want to thank our guests, Special Envoy Elon Carr. Thank you so much for the fabulous work you're doing and also for the fabulous work the Trump administration is doing on behalf of Israel and the Jewish people and Zionism. Thank you so much. And of course, Mort Klein, our national president, who's been dealing with power outages and no, no air conditioning and no lighting in his home, uh, who's been a real trooper tonight to hang in there and, and be, with us, be with us and give his uh, thoughts tonight. And of course, all of, all of the leadership you do. Uh, Six days a week, 24, 24 six. Thank you, Mort. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Take care. And may you go from strength to strength.